Um, hi, I'm here to welcome our AI seminar speaker today, Greg Versteeg. Uh, Greg has been part of the ISI community for a long time, and this year he started as an associate uh, professor at UC Riverside, uh, which we're all very excited about. Greg's uh, research approach is to take ideas from physics and information system or information theory and combine them to um, find new machine learning methods. And then he uses those machine learning methods to analyze complex systems like human behavior uh, and um, biology. So take it away, Greg, uh, and thanks for coming. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Really fun to be here with you guys and uh, I don't know, just be all in person again. And uh, feel free to ask questions and stuff during because I, I think it should be like a more relaxed, uh, relaxed seminar. And I'm also really excited. I mean, so of course, we've all gotten to know each other over the years and different types of research, but I I haven't talked about this research with almost any of you, so I'm happy to talk about something uh, new and uh, and see what you think. Okay, so first we have to start with um, like I don't know if people are experiencing like a kind of whiplash effect with uh, machine learning things. I mean, so like uh, Dolly two, this image generation thing that really that wasn't even a year ago that that first came out. But it seems like it's been out for 100 years and that this is like really old, old stuff now. And then with GPT, oh my gosh, it's like in the time you've, since you sat down, there could be five new versions of GPT doing whatever new stuff. So it's like kind of crazy how fast these things are, are progressing. So for me, it's very comforting to, uh, <laughs> to, to take this and, and put it into perspective in terms of technically what's going on with these things. And in some sense, at their core, both of these things are really probability modeling approaches. With GPT, if you know much about it, it's like really obvious that that's what it is. It's like literally the objective, the core objective is just modeling probability. With diffusion models, um, that might not be quite as clear to you why this is really just at its, at its heart a probability modeling problem, but that's something I'll talk about uh, during this talk. So we'll see how, how tight that connection is. Um, okay. so. So instead of uh, this, uh, all these like crazy overwhelming results. So I like to think about probability modeling like in a more boring way. <laughs> like we take a picture like this. So what is probability modeling really? It's just saying we have some training data, that's these points. And we're trying to fit a model which puts high probability wherever the points are and low probability everywhere else. But that's kind of like uh, more abstract but more approachable in some ways. Uh, it's an extremely useful thing to be able to do this to model a complex probability distribution. Um, you can tell things like if we observe something over here, we know we should be very surprised. This is very unlikely. Um, you can understand uh, relationships in the data through this probability distribution. And uh, of course, uh, you, you, you all know probably, or many of you know that I'm very keen about using information theory uh, to uh, analyze things. So whenever you look at something in information theory, the very first thing you see is that it's a function of P of X, right? So you need to know the probability distribution to estimate any of these information quantities. So it's, it's great if we can model this. But really, uh, until, <laughs> until recently, we couldn't really get good probability models of text or images. And you know that's what's kind of changed in this past like year is that we now really have excellent probability models over text and images. So um, the reasons for that, I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different pieces to it, but the reasons are kind of like intellectually not very satisfying. I mean, most of it comes from, oh, so most of it comes from the scale of the data, the scale of the compute and the scale of the data. But there is something to be said for the architectures that we use in both cases, like, um, you know, uh, convolutional and, uh, and attention type mechanisms, like they really do help a lot. And the reason I mention that is you could imagine saying, oh, we've solved the probability modeling problem at high dimensions. And I'm not sure that that's true, actually. Like we can de definitely do a great job now with text and images, but maybe not with arbitrary data types. So anyway, but we do have these now. So um, one, of the, uh, one of the outcomes of finally having good uh, probability models for text and images uh, is that um, we can, uh, well, one of the things it does is it makes sampling cool again. So I don't know if sampling was actually ever cool and I'm still not sure that it is, but you know, like 
I, I always really liked the problem of sampling from probability <laughs> displacement. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I know at least a few people would, would agree. So, you know, it's just, you know, what, what do we mean by sampling? Well, we've learned this probability distribution. Really, we just want to like find new points that have high probability, right? Very, very simple kind of idea, but like tons and tons and tons of, of uh, very mathematical work on this topic. So, um, Okay, so what makes it cool? Why is sampling cool? Well, it, sampling is cool again because what we're sampling is distributions like what's the probability distribution over all images conditioned on some prompt? And that's really what diffusion models are helping us do is to sample from that distribution. To, first of all, to learn that distribution and then sample from it, which is great. This was one of the first things I generated when Dali came out. Uh, and I just, I just instantly fell in love with this cute little robot guy, robot artist over here. So. I was really very impressed by this. Uh, of course, by now I'm very jaded and cynical and I hate everything. But at the time I was really excited. And so I went to, I had a friend who's an artist and I, I showed this to her and I was like, she's gonna be so blown away with this. And her first reaction was, oh, what rubbish. <laughs> this, this painting in the background is not like Kandinsky at all. <laughs> it's like, oh man, I was just so heartbroken. Like, really? I was like, Kandinsky is the paint splotch guy, right? Those are paint splotches. No, 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 no. <laughs> Kandinsky is a very special type of paint splotch and this is nothing like it. So anyway, so it's not like, uh, that, that was my first like reality check in this, <clears throat> in this domain. So I asked uh, this artist, Eduarda, I asked her to, uh, to generate something. And you know, as an artist, she has to like, she gets commissioned to do artworks. And this is sort of like homework to her. She doesn't really want to do it. She wants to do her own art and not do commission pieces. So she had some ideas that were to help her solve this uh, commission work she had to do. So her first prompt, you know, this was a hundred years ago uh, <laughs> when Dali came out. So her first prompt was actually really good. I mean, nowadays there's like millions of people online who are doing prompt engineering to generate cool things with chat GPT and with Dolly and so forth. But her first prompt is actually really good. Like she, she, her instincts were very good. So it's this very specific thing. And the thing that it generated was this. I was like, yeah, this is, this is pretty good. And she was actually excited by this. She said, oh, okay, this is uh, nice. It gives me some ideas. I could actually use this. Now, again, we have to quibble a little bit. I mean, of course, Picasso's blue period is characterized by a blue palette, which we have, but the brush strokes really are not characteristic of Picasso's blue period. But Still, it gave her some ideas. She was happy with it. This was in the right, this was in the right, right ballpark. Um, the other thing that you can do with these systems is not to just generate images, but you can do uh, like conditional sampling where you say condition on this part of the image being here, what would be like, how could we sample over the space of images which would fit here? So you can extend images, you can do in painting and all these things. So we could extend this and, you know, and I, show, I showed her that we could extend these photos and she's like, oh, this is cool. It starts to, it starts to tell a story and I liked that way of putting it, that, that it tells a story because a story can have many different possibilities. That's what makes a story interesting, but it can't be arbitrary either. If something like really weird happens in a story that kind of pulls you out of it. So um, this is something we can actually think about a little bit in terms of uh, what type of, uh, when we do this sampling, like how, how coherent of a story does it tell? Okay. so. To study that, <laughs> this is one of Edvard's paintings, actually. This is not AI generated. This is a real painting. So um, uh, she, she always she has a series where the, the figures, the main figures have their kind of eyes cut off. And I never asked her why, because I'm too, I'm not confident enough to talk to an artist. Like, I'll say something stupid. I assume it's to, you know, draw your attention to different aspects of the composition, body language, and so forth. But it always really bothered me. And now this is something we can use uh, Dolly 2 to uh, we can use diffusion models to sample what the rest of this image should look like. So, so um, the reason, so I want to show you, I, so I sampled many different images of what this should look like. And it's kind of interesting from a probability modeling point of view, because we can look at things like, so like there, there's different things I can like draw your attention to here. First of all, so the variety is actually pretty good, right? So like the, the hairstyles that it gives in every single case are completely different. Um, even things like the couch, has like different different backs and different backgrounds uh, in every single case. Um, so that's that's kind of cool. The other thing that we can look at is 
um, how cohesive are these images? Like, do they all really make sense? And I think most of them are really good. You get some kind of crazy things like there's like a, an extra hand stuck in this woman's hair. So that one's a bit wacky. And then also this cat turns into like sort of a multi-headed cat down here. So, you know, there's still issues with the overall cohesion, but like generally it's really good variety and it's really cohesive, you know? So it's like, it seems to be doing a, a, a pretty nice job of capturing this sort of a complex probability distribution. Um, okay, so there's uh, one or two other high level things I wanna say before we get into like the more mathematical part, like why this is, uh, uh, what, what the mathematical connections with information theory are. So the other thing is that it's learning a probability distribution, but that means it's really not, probably not surprising for anyone who studied fairness literature that the, the biases in your data will be reflected in the probability distribution that you learn. So, um, uh, so um, as an example, you could take the stable diffusion model and you can give it a prompt like a cartoon of a computer science professor. And of course, no surprise, it's like almost exclusively generating white men for this prompt. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of a tricky problem to solve because if the, bias, the data is biased, you're gonna get biased models. But there is something a little funny happening. If we put the same prompt in for DALI 2, you actually get like way, way better results. Now, DALI 2 is from OpenAI, which means it's actually closed AI. So we don't actually know, <laughs> we don't actually know how this, how this is, is working. Like, did they find some sort of utopian data set where everybody is equally represented? That's uh, very, very unlikely. So um, the, the solution I got from, uh, or I think what, what the solution to this, this uh, problem is, I got from a, um, a professor of tech ethics on TikTok. And I really just love this lady. She, she does like amazing TikTok videos. Like she'll, she'll, her classes are a series of TikTok videos and she'll have her students watch the TikTok videos. And then anyway, you, you, all sorts of great things. Now, but there, there's this really fascinating kind of experiment to reveal what was happening with, uh, with Dolly 2. It turns out that if you ask Dolly 2 to show like a sign, but you don't say what's on the sign, it will tend to um, leak text from the prompt into the sign itself. So you can use this as a way to sort of reverse engineer what's really happening behind the scenes in this case. And so what seems to be happening is that uh, for Dolly 2, if you ask for a generic person, scientist, it will say, okay, you ask for a generic person, I'm gonna append some specific demographics to give better diversity to the things that we, that we generate. And the only way we can tell that this is really happening is by doing this sign trick and seeing that even though you didn't put any sort of demographic in your, in your prompt, it appeared here in the sign. So anyway, it was kind of an interesting, uh, uh, <laughs> interesting um, to see the limitation of learning probability distributions and to see what are the sort of uh, band-aids that people are, are trying to use to fix this. You, I mean, you see this really with all the GPT systems too, that people are trying to use prompt engineering to um, get the, the system to, to move away from what the data was, which is internet data, which is, has a lot of garbage and to try to like push it in a better direction. I think this is probably a very limited approach, like how much we can actually accomplish this way, but it's what, that's what people are doing at the moment. Uh, okay, so one more, one more high level thing before we get into the, 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 the weeds more. <laughs> Um, another question you can ask about is whether these generative models like violate copyright, like we train on your images and then generate new images, is that violating your copyright? You know, like from a legal point of view, you said there's kind of a fair use standard where if a work is sufficiently transformed, it might be considered fair use, but how, how transformed, and that, that's like a technical question that, you know, is certainly not in the law, but we could try to formulate but it's difficult to even formulate as a question, like how transformed do we consider to be transformed? And one way that you can see this is actually um, also a, a way to see how, how good the UNET architecture and diffusion models is. So you can actually train a diffusion model on a single image. So this is a single real image. You can train a diffusion model on that single image and generate a new image. And it produces something really, really good. It's not an exact replica, but it's basically, you know, it's basically tiling patches in some sort of coherent way to make an image which is uh, very different, but is, you know, deep down, we know it's like a copy. This is the only information about images it has is from this. So, um, you know, from a, from a mathematical perspective, it'd be hard, it's hard to figure out how we could see that this image 
is a copy of this one when at a pixel by pixel level, you don't see any exact overlaps. So anyway, another very interesting question. Yeah. You need to train on really on a single image or is that a pre-trained model and you find No, it's not pre-trained. It's, it's, it's trained on a single image. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that this works. In, in a way, the reason is that um, diffusion models are really, you know, you can say they're really training on a bunch of patches. So there's like millions of patches. If this is like a super high resolution image, which this is, you've got to train on many, many patches. And it learned enough of these like, patch signals that it could like put it together, you know, make a new one that's put together and combinations of that original image. Yeah. 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 So it's kind of bananas, right? That like maybe also could like make you kind of skeptical of the uh, of the results we get. Like it's really good at giving making sure that the microscopic details never look weird. Uh you know <laughs> so, so, so we might miss the the kind of higher level signals that are that are messed up in some ways. I don't know. Like the, you, you can see here that there's actually some kind of like periodicity to to it. Like you'll see exact features reproduced. Yeah. That's a kind of mistake that we don't perceive very easily. Uh, and well, it only knows this kind of jagged terrain. Right, right. It right, produces yeah. that type of terrain. Right, right. It's possible. Okay. There's really no there. There's no pre-training at all in the sense that I mean any model weights and parameters are simply random. Right. I believe that there's no pre-training at all. And there's actually like several papers on this topic. Um, yeah, so it's pretty pretty crazy. I assume they train like a number of times on the same image, um, like, like with different noise. And... Uh, yeah, I don't know how they do the the training on the single image. I'm not sure exactly how that part works. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I wasn't exactly going to talk about this, but it's kind of related to this general question of how much information we get or is represented in diffusion models. So, uh, okay, so, so these are the two like actual research things I want to talk about. So I spent a lot of time on the uh, the high level pictures of what's happening with diffusion models. So the first is um, what exactly is the connection between diffusion models and probability models? And depending on what you already know about them, maybe there will be different levels of surprise about this. And then, um, you know, so we introduced this, which is a, a, a new kind of mathematical formulation of this connection, which is very exact. And then I, I want to see what we can do with this new formulation um, in terms of things like decomposing the different types of information, which are are in images. Uh, okay, so these are the diffusion <laughs> created portraits. Uh, so my, my, at the beginning of the talk, I have one too of the of my collaborators on this. Uh, so Rob Breckelman, you all know he's. Oh, many of you probably know he's now at Vector Institute. Um, okay, so the the uh, primary mathematical object that we consider is something that sounds pretty boring. We consider Gaussian noise channels. So there's some image X, and we add various amounts of Gaussian noise to it. So uh, the amount of noise that we add is, is controlled by this parameter, which I'm calling gamma, which is the signal to noise ratio. So that's a very simple, very simple object. So of course we can add noise very easily, but we can also think about how easy it is to remove noise uh, from, from a, uh, and recover X from a noisy version of X. Um, so that's an, a well-formed op optimization problem. So it's this minimum, mean square error optimization to find a decoder, which takes in a noisy image and outputs, tries to output something which is as close to the original image as possible. So this MMSE, I'm gonna write like about a million more times <laughs> over the course of this. So I wanna make sure that, that you know, that's kind of clear, but it is a really simple thing, right? It's, it really is, it's a regression problem fundamentally to find a function which, you know, predicts X from Z. So, you know, working with a uh, regression problem is nice because, Neural nets are very good at solving regression problems. So this is a good thing to, to be working with. Okay, so the, the optimal denoiser in the Gaussian noise channel is like a super well-studied uh, quantity, actually. Like long before uh, what we're calling diffusion models, this was studied a lot. And so uh, in information theory, there was this uh, famous result starting in 2005 called the IMMSC relationship relations, which said that there's a relationship between information and denoising. And the type of relationship that we saw in that literature is uh, expressions like this, that the MMSE is related to mutual information. Like, I, I always thought that was cool and I wanted to use it for machine learning. And, uh, and so now we finally get to see how that works. 
At first glance, though, this doesn't look super interesting because this is the mutual information between X and the noisy version of X. Usually when you're estimating mutual information, you care about something specific, like between A and B, two separate things. So, so it's not so obvious why this is a good thing to work with. But they showed in this literature that there's a ton of things that you can get from that. One of, just as an example, and something that kind of mirrors what we're gonna do in a minute, um, you can do, you can like use this result to come up with alternate forms for other quantities like entropy. I mean, entropy of X is like a really well-defined thing that you might wanna get. Um, normally we'd write that as expectation of log P of X, which is quite annoying. But there's this form of the entropy where we write it in terms of the MMSE for this denoising channel. So that's very cool. And if you if you know a little about uh, diffusion models, you'd say this is starting to look very familiar because we have a mean square error uh, denoising problem that's integrated over different noise levels. And that's sort of, that's very close to what we're doing in diffusion models. So it's still not quite, the connection is still not quite there though because you know, H of X is like an average quantity, whereas what we usually care about in machine learning is log P of X, what is the density for a specific image? So that's what we're gonna to try to get to is from this type of IMMSE relation to something which is about uh, density modeling. Uh, okay, so this is the most <laughs> technical slide, so you don't have to follow any of the details, but the basic idea here is that I said, these are both averages over X. So we wanna introduce pointwise versions of these uh, in both cases. So the pointwise mutual information is really to say that the mutual information is an average over X of something. And this is one way we can write that pointwise mutual information. And the same thing for MMSE. MMSE is really the average error. So we can say, what is the error of the optimal denoiser at a specific point X? So these are the two pointwise quantities. And so what we wanna say, first of all, is the, is the relationship that I showed earlier for the average quantities, does it hold in the pointwise case? And the answer is yes, it does hold, but it's still uh, not in the form that we were that we were hoping for. So the one other kind of mathematical thing that we had to use is uh, building on some uh, work from Rob's uh, that explored this idea of thermodynamic integration. You do a kind of a mathematical trick where you, <laughs> you know, the problem is we have something like a derivative of a KL divergence in that in that quantity. So we say, okay, well, if you take the integral of a derivative. It gives you the, it just gives you the limits of the thing inside. And the limits in this case are log likelihood ratios, which is good. This is what we were trying to get to is log likelihood ratios. And then we can use the identity to represent what this derivative inside is. And the, the outcome is to get some expression like this. So let me uh, pull, pull this up and, and we can look at some of the details before I hide the details of this too, because they're, they're not all so relevant. So first of all, most of the expressions here are all constants. They have nothing to do with X. So I'm going to hide them in a minute, but um, but it's kind of interesting because we get that the log, log likelihood is related to Gaussian entropy. And then we have like a MMSE for Gaussian is what this expression is versus the MMSE for the data. So it's like saying, how much better can we denoise our data than data which was actually Gaussian. And that difference is what tells us what the log likelihood of the data. So if we if we plotted that, uh, we'd have, so this is the signal to noise ratio. It's how much noise we're adding to an image before we try to recover it. And we look at the error. And the, the error for our actual data, which is images and has some structure, is lower um, but than it would be if what we were trying to denoise was actually a Gaussian signal to begin with. Because we can use the structure in the data to uh, do a better job of denoising, basically. And this, and the integral of this gap is log likelihood. And that's exactly the case. Um, it's not a bound. It's not a variational bound. It's exactly the case. So anyway, that's the, the kind of uh, main result. Um, so because it's exact, I mean, it maybe is not so surprising that it's, it's going to be a, a little bit of an improvement over the typical diff diffusion objective, uh, variational diffusion objective, which is just a bound. Um, but I, I think there's some other benefits, I think, that come from writing it in, in this way, which we'll also explore. Okay, so this is my summary uh, of, of the results. It's like log likelihood is exactly related to an MMSE problem and nothing else. This is purely regression. There's no distributions anywhere. There's no, no other stuff. Uh, this was formulated for continuous probability density. If X is continuous probability density functions, there's a similar result if X is discrete, 
which is like even simpler actually. It's this is if x is discrete, this this constant goes away. It's a constant equals zero. So then it becomes an even simpler expression. And so it's kind of interesting that the same uh, the same optimization problem gives us either continuous or discrete density. Also kind of kind of cool. Okay, so um, how how does this how does the typical math look like for diffusion models as as probability models? The way the, the way this usually looks is that you get uh, a bound on log likelihood um, in terms of uh, a sum of different things. And I'm going to show you uh, I, I show you what it looks like. I, you don't have to read the details, but I'm just saying every paper that does density modeling with diffusion has a a page sort of like this. This isn't proving anything. This is what it takes to state the result, what the bound is. It's kind of complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because you have to invoke all of these things. You need the forward Markov chain, which adds noise progressively. You need a reverse chain, which is this sort of denoiser network. <clears throat> uh, and then what you, what you basically do is you use the variational bound, the same as you'd use in a VAE, except you imagine that you have like a hierarchy of VAEs and the encoder is just X plus noise and you apply the elbow for each um, term in the, um, in the hierarchy, and it gives you a different elbow, that's the L0 through LT. And these terms are a little bit uh, different. So there's this sort of discrete reconstruction term, something that we call a prior term often in, in VAEs. And then there's the mean square error terms, which is what we actually care about. Um, so uh, to, so, you know, so, so, so these mean square error terms are really exactly what we've been talking about. Mean square error means add some noise, some Gaussian noise, and use your neural net to, to remove that noise. So um, when we compare to our expression, so there's, of course, the, the mean square error terms are really doing fundamentally the same thing. Um, but uh, there's sort of an advantage to our approach because we, we actually get rid of these extra terms and we get rid of the inequality so we can make this tight. Um, and you know, besides making the, the expression tight, um, I think there's some extra insight that we can get from writing it in this way. Um, okay. So I should show one of these kind of classic results, even though I find them uh, sort of boring. I mean, they're good. So how do we normally test probability density estimates? We, we do this kind of... Um, expected log likelihood on test data problem. So we'll take something like CIFAR 10 images. And you know, just to remind you, we're taking the, the training data, learning a probability distribution, and then we're going to look at test images. And we want to see that test images are assigned high likelihood also. So um, this is using, uh, we're, we're just going to use a, 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 a pre-trained uh, state-of-the-art diffusion model for this problem. Um, and you can see, okay, so the variational bound gives us some expected log likelihood of like 4.05 bits per dimension. Because our, so we can apply our bound directly on the pre-trained model. And sometimes we actually get even a slight benefit, you know, e even just taking the exact same model and uh, applying our tighter bound, you maybe get a small benefit. But, uh, but you really see a better, when you really see an advantage if you actually optimize our information theoretic bound, then you can get a little bit more of a benefit. So. Again, like I said, these are kind of boring because this is one of these problems where we're probably pretty close to the peak of like how many bits per dimension you can, like the true bits per dimension of the data. Um, but it's nice to see that, that, you know, getting a tighter bound does actually give us a little bit of extra uh, uh, representation power for this, for this data set. Um, okay, so yeah, so, so the part that's more, I think, more interesting is to see what we can do with this um, with this different mathematical formulation. And there's a whole bunch of different directions that we're exploring. Um, but I'm just going to talk about one, which is this information decomposition idea and, uh, and why I'm interested in information decomposition. Uh, so, so let me describe that part first, what I, what I mean by macro causality. Uh, okay. So the, uh, the macro causality problem or the, the light switch problem, as I call it, is like this. There's like an experiment that you do all the time 
where you like you go into a room and you flip a light switch and the light switch goes on and you feel very confident that you've established a really uh, strong causal connection here and you don't have to do randomized trials or anything i mean you might but you don't have to you feel very convinced that you know it's just that one switch you're like ah that's it that that's the that's the causal link between light switches and, and light going on so um why is that so easy and why is it so hard for ai so you can imagine an ai system has uh, high resolution cameras in the room and it can take in every, you know, millions and millions of pixels of information about what's happening in this room. And if you imagine showing up the data of what just happened, you know, of someone <laughs> coming in and flipping a switch, it, it would be very difficult to get the causal story correct from this data. And one reason for that is that it's, it's kind of difficult to go from this, what I call micro variable data, this like pixel level, uh, variable data to the macro variable description, which for us is the sort of right level of abstraction to to describe what's going on here. And so, you know, when you look at the pixel data, you'll find all sorts of correlations between the lights being on and certain pixels being whatever. All the pixels are going to change when the lights go on. They'll, they'll change their value. So it's going to be very difficult to figure out what that causal story is. So this is the the kind of uh, Kind of a motivating problem I've had in the back of my mind for for uh, several years is like how could we solve this problem? How could we identify these like macro states, uh, switch states from the micro level data? And that's something I'm hoping. Oh, maybe now, maybe now we're in a position to uh, to get at some of this. And of course, it's not you know it, although we use images because it's like really easy to work with images and to interpret it. Uh, really, we care. It's even more of a problem in other domains, like um, if we have like social data about uh, people's individual actions, but we don't really care about like every single action that you take. We want to care something something about a person's macro state. Um, uh, for groups of individuals, we might care about what is the macro state of this organization. And then in health is a, is another one where you can take things like gene expression or or MRI data. This is super high dimensional, but we feel like there should be some sort of um, higher level macro states that we're really interested in. Um, okay, so so I don't know if we'll solve this problem, but I'm just giving you this is sort of the motivation for what I'm trying to do with the information decomposition point of view. So the the idea is um, that when we're looking at the images, variables that are individual pixels are not meaningful to us. Like we have a feeling that. You know, in every image, the pixels which are important are different. They have to do with where these objects are. So there's a question of whether the diffusion model, which is powerful enough to model all these different types of images, um, can it recognize, is it really recognizing these images in some way? Can we find where the information is about certain types of elements of the picture, for instance? Uh, okay. So... Okay, well, <laughs> last equations are on, on this slide, but the, the example I'm gonna have is, um, uh, so X is gonna be some sort of image, it's this image from the COCO data set, and Y is a text prompt or um, a text description in this case, uh, a boy sitting by a giant teddy bear. And we wanna decompose in information and find out where is the information from this description, where is that represented in the image? Like, can we find the, the objects? Uh, so the way we're going to do that is with pointwise mutual information. Uh, so I kind of mentioned this briefly a, a, a little while ago. Um, pointwise mutual information, you can write like this, log p of x given y minus log p of x. If we take the expectation of this over, over the data, we'd get mutual information. Right? So this is sort of telling us the contribution from a certain uh, relationship. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So the first thing that we're gonna do with this pointwise mutual information is that we'll say, oh, we're gonna use the, the identity that we derived earlier, which says that log P of X or log P of X given Y can be represented in terms of uh, some mean square error problems, right? If we, uh, right, this, this is just, you know, exactly can be written as this integral over mean square error at different noise levels. Um, so the mean square error itself can be actually decomposed a little bit. This mean square error is an L2 norm. And you can you can write it as a sum of uh, these xi squared error terms. So it's sum of sum of contributions from different pixels. And if we plug that back into our our uh, identity for how to represent log p of x, we see that we can write the pointwise mutual information 
as a sum of contributions from each pixel. So that's kind of nice because uh, this is not something that would be obvious to do with, <laughs> it wouldn't be obvious how to do it here because the, there's no, there's no, uh, uh, there's no factorization of these P of X's. These are very complex multivariate P of X's. The fact that we can break this into pixel wise terms is, is nice. So, so uh, we've just been doing this for a few days. <laughs> so, so let me show you some of the preliminary results, though you know, we still haven't like really uh, gotten very deep into this. So for this example I showed, um, what are the informative pixels? And we just put like kind of a heat map here. Uh, the info and this is really information about the prompt, a boy sitting by a giant teddy bear. So you get some high information pixels by the face and also by the teddy bear's face, which is kind of cut off up here. But we can do other things like um, we can say, well, what, are, what would be the information in the prompt just about teddy bear? And we, in that case, we can highlight just the pixels which are from teddy bear and not from the, not from the boy. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm yeah. confused. So yeah. the prompt is actually the heat map itself, or or this is or it's generating the heat map from from the prompt. Uh, yeah, it's generating the heat map from the prompt. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of hard to see here that like you know uh, we're decomposing this oh, of x okay. given y, I see. right? Okay. And so yeah. really, there's like a contribution from each pixel for a given y. I should have put maybe like a little y in here. Okay. And so, yeah, right. And so then we can modify the different, the Y's also and say, you know, if, if the prompt were something else, where would the information be in this case? Yeah. yeah. A quick question about the prompt. So this is based on like the entire data set you're working with, or this is like a pre-trained model and you're just trying to see what the features that stand out? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So this is using a pre-trained stable diffusion model. Okay. So the, the relationships between X and Y are learned from looking at the, I don't know how to say it, the LAION 5B data set. That's the one, it's a, it's a data set of images with captions. So that data set, it has learned relationships between images and captions from that data set, um, which, is, which is what it uses to generate you know, new images from, from new captions. Uh, so in a way you should say, Right, because the model is trained that way. This is visualizing the relationships as learned from that data set. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And just a follow up question. So yeah. I know like there's all these models, clip models and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Sort of like do segmentation and create the text description based on this and then use it to feed the image stuff. So I don't know, like, is this also sort of like same paradigm thing or is it like description that actual, you know, real data, like, oh, a painting of whatever, Salvador Dali doing this and that, which is coming from more of like a human description, natural language kind of way. Because I think this is the thing that confuses mo most about these, because when it comes from clip, it's different because it's segmentation, right? So it's machine feeding machine. When it comes from human annotated data, it has a more descriptive natural language sort of sense to it. Uh, yes. Okay. So let me see if I'm understanding your question. So one way we could get this is from a clip model. We could actually generate, we could take this and generate a description from a clip model, uh, which is then kind of weird because then we're saying we have like a machine model which gives us this information and then we're querying what information it has about the image, uh, right? So it's not that. These prompts are human generated okay. from the, this is from the, these test images are from the COCO data set. So the model is trained on the okay. LA, uh, this other caption data set and this is descriptions from the COCO data set. Um, yes. Stable diffusion does have a clip model built into it though. The way it parses this text is with a clip model, uh, which is then used for conditioning for the uh, diffusion, the denoising process. So anyway, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. So when you say information in the prompt about teddy bear, is it like you just use the embedding for the teddy bear or like how do you separate teddy bear itself from the prompt? Yeah. There's uh, about a million ways I can think of to do this. <laughs> and it would be nice to talk to you about it because you thought about this a lot too. Um, so in this case, I said, well, what if the prompt is, I think this in this one, we just said, what if the prompt is just teddy bear? But you could say, what if we mask teddy bear? What if we, what if we modify the embeddings rather than the prompt? Uh, so I feel like there's like a ton of different ways to approach this. Yeah, but the one you used is like thing like the first way to attack, I think. Yeah, right, right. So they seem like most straightforward. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry. Just a minute. So I'm noticing the functioning problem to the letters in the teddy bear shirt are also highlighted. Oh, yeah. So where's that coming from? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, the, I, right. And so, you know, I'm also like showing a certain and heat map. And the, and the face of the letter yeah. make complete sense. They're awesome. Yeah, yeah. But why the letters suddenly get. Okay, yeah. These are like, yeah, these are really interesting things to think about. <laughs> this is, yeah, the heat map I'm also just showing you with like some scaling. If we showed the heat map differently, maybe it would look different. There's really some information all over. Letters have, they're sort of like intrinsically higher complexity so that the mean square error that you get when you try to decode, uh, when, when you're trying to denoise the letters is higher. So I think there could be like a higher variance problem here. That, yeah, because of all the sharp edges. Right, right, because of all the sharp edges. And you, you'll notice that diffusion models have a very hard time modeling uh, words. Or they, they, model, they model letters, but they, they can be garbled or they won't be real words or anything because it's like, yeah, anyway. So I think that that's probably an effect from this like high variance of the error in that region. <laughs> And we really don't want that, right? Like for, because like, it's it's not really relevant for this information decomposition. Oh, but, and and there's nothing in here that says anything about words on the shirt, right? So like it shouldn't actually be uh, highlighting this, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think you mentioned briefly, uh, but is uh, should I interpret that uh, parts of the pictures that are not color coded? contribute no information no I, like i said that there's like a color scheme to make this visible and there's really like small amounts of information everywhere and part of what we're trying to figure out is like we really would like from this macro state point of view we really would like to uh have an unsupervised way to crisply uh segment the images and i'm not sure whether this approach will let us do that or not um yeah, sorry. Is that is that what you were yeah, yeah. what you're getting at? Yeah, I'll, I'll show a different view in a few slides, which will give you kind of a more of a sense of like uh, the fuzziness of this. I have a question from from the oh, web. I guess. Oh, nice. I'm supposed to be monitoring them. Yeah, yeah. So Nina asking if is there a way for us to measure faithful, faithfulness of these explanations versus where the true information is from a human perspective? So I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. I, how, how close is that to the human? Yeah. Which I don't know. You have to ask humans to label the regions. The... Right. And so the reason, so the reason this is from the Coco data set is that the Coco data set has a ton of information. So it does have humans who have done pixel level segmentation. And so and this is so this is really a very natural question for Mina. Uh, and one of the things we're going to do next is um, figure out how, how to turn this pixel information into a segmentation and compare it with the human segmentation. Um, so that's 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 right. So I'm a little bit confused about how you decompose to the pixel level because there yeah. are a lot of variants of this. Yeah. You know, like effectively, an image is a joint probability of all the pixels. Right. Right. right, right. And the, there are like ten different pictures you could imagine of a boy sitting by a giant teddy bear, right. and any given pixel is not going to be meaningful unless you look at the right. joint distribution but it looked like in the decomposition that kind of disappeared right? uh you know i this is oversimplified notation i, I really should have put x and y in here mm -hmm. um because you know it, this still depends on the specific x and y and um one and, and maybe one way to give you intuition about why um why this contribution depends on the specific x and y is to think about like what's actually uh, happening to compute this MMSE. What's actually happening behind the scenes is that we take this image, we add some Gaussian noise, and then we try to recover what these individual pixels, pixels should be. And so um, when it sees, uh, if it thinks there's, bear, there's a bear in here and it will try to, you know, these pixels, it can reduce the error on by knowing that there's a bear in this image. But these pixels, they have nothing. They're they're like just background pixels. They have low error, and and knowing any extra information won't help in this case. And the pixels where you get a, a boost from knowing something like some side information uh, will vary from image to image. So that so that the contribution per pixel will change for every image. Yeah, I don't know. Does that does that kind of? I think so. I think that that helps in that it's sort of contextualized to the image because you're yeah. starting with the, this p of x. Right, right, yeah, 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 right, right. It's eleven forty-seven. Ah, okay. So I'm almost done. So, oh, okay, okay. and uh, I'm glad we got. I'm glad people are asking questions during. There was no. There was no rush. <laughs> These are the main things I wanted to talk about. Yeah, that's good. Um,
Yeah, so let's see. So let me show one or two other images. So this, oh yeah, this is what I was saying is that uh, the kind of, if you look at kind of the heat map, which, and I didn't put the scale on here, which is stupid, but the dark blue is, is kind of zero and the red is like the hotter, more information. So, okay, sketch of a monkey with a hat. This is actually a generated image uh, because we were kind of interested if it was sort of different for real images or generated images. So the informative pixels from the prompt are, you know, generally the monkey and the hat. Um, but if we, if we uh, modify the prompt from, I think in this case, we were trying to modify hat to like a mask or something, like a masked word or something. You can see that these are the pixels which are more informative about just the hat part, for instance. Um, and I mean, we would like to, okay, so, you know, we, you know, whether we could do a good segmentation is kind of hard to see here. Like it, it seems like, if we were doing this clever early enough, we could segment the the image from the background and maybe even segment the hat pretty crisply from the from the head. Uh, but we're, we're also thinking like, are there more complex types of interventions that we can make um, and probe how how the information um, how that information would be reflected in an image? So in this case, we tried doing an intervention where we change happy to sad, and it seems like it's a pretty targeted. Pretty targeted in this case that it gets you know just the just the smile maybe so this would be kind of cool also if and, and you know it's not just adjectives like we're thinking um, so objects is sort of like the most the easiest case because we can do some comparison with uh, object segmentation benchmarks but you can imagine changing modifiers and changing actions and it's not even very well defined from a human point of view if I say that a dog is running versus lying down what are the pixels it's I mean it's a still image. But there are there are pixels which are informative about that. But how would you ask a human to say what are the informative pixels? Should be the legs, kind of. And we kind of see that in experiments that the legs are more informative about whether he's lying or running, lying down or, or running. But anyway, so the, these these kinds of higher, higher level um, information questions are things that we'd like to explore more. Uh, okay. Um, so let me wrap up. I have to say, because um, I'm at ISA, I have to, I'm, oh, sorry, was there another question? Or, oh, I'm, I'm obligated to say some of the other cool, cool things that I'm doing with people at ISI. Jose Luis is here, and so we're doing the Federated Learning for Neuroimaging. And there's lots of interesting information questions here um, about things like, um, there, there's like information we don't want, which is that the, the scanners all have different sorts of noise that we'd like to eliminate. But if you're doing federated learning, you can't share information because you might leak private information. So there's tons of interesting things there. And Merle's here and um, is doing another like very macro state like uh, bit of research with gene expression, where he, he like uses some interesting new ideas uh, for embedding uh, for embeddings to find these sort of um, high level what I consider switch states. And maybe I, I don't know if I've used that terminology now from my slide. You can see why I consider it that way. It's like these are the sort of macro states in gene expression. So um, Anyway, just a few other uh, random things. Um, the sampling uh, with dynamics, so like these generative models take a huge amount of resources. So um, speeding up sampling by using better dynamics is also like a big problem, which I still like to think about um, a lot. And yeah, um, so that, that's, that, that's it. This, uh, the main, this main uh, you know, theme I was trying to convince you is that the probability and denoising are really equivalent in some sense. And for me, whenever I think about probability now, I'm always keeping this in the back of my mind. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of ways that we can exploit this, um, this relationship, this equivalence. Um, I've wanted to do uh, stuff with images and information theory for a long time, but there was never really a model of probability for images, which was good enough. And now we have these like amazing probability models. So I hope that some of these ideas about doing um, fancy things with information decomposition can finally um, can finally be useful in some of these complex systems. So, yeah, thanks again. I really appreciate everybody coming in person. It's nice to be here. So. Any more questions? Okay. Are you ready? Um, so I think uh, Max here. Some uh, there's. I heard that. The fusion models over sample the higher probability like they don't necessarily sample according to the probability of the data but like there's kind of an overestimation of the yeah. prob higher probabilities yeah um do you think this has any 
relation to that and that you want the exact first bound. Uh, yeah, I would say that the impact there. The, the, that the um, phenomenon there is really, let's see. So, so this is an example of like a probability distribution where there's two modes, but like one of the modes is more likely. And um, so I think that the, the kind of fundamental problem here isn't that the, the probability estimation might be very good. And actually, I don't know if this is something anyone has explored. The difference between um, what is being sampled and the actual probability distribution. So my hypothesis, though I don't know, it's just total speculation. My hypothesis is that the density estimation is probably very good, but the way that the, um, the way that the sampling works is to use these like score modeling. That's these sort of, uh, it's like learning these little vectors, right? At every point you're saying, what's the direction I should go to move towards a more likely location. And um, this sampling part is very, that's very difficult. I, that's what we put most of the computation into. And you can see that if there's a very likely area, it's very easy for the kind of samples to congregate towards the more higher density region first. So my, that's my guess. Because of the way we do sampling, it tends to favor the higher probability modes, but that the density estimate itself doesn't have this problem, which means in principle, if we had a better sampler for that probability distribution, we could improve on this. Uh, what's, I wonder what the right way to, yeah. And I think there's some ways we could quantify that too. So, yeah, anyway, I think that's it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sorry. Um, actually, it's two questions, but I think they're related, but I would love to know how. <laughs> so, the first question is about the noise. So, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone loves Gaussian noise. And I think yeah. also because, um, you know, you're an information theory as well person. Yeah. SNR and <laughs> Gaussian noise is like your thing. So I'm just curious, and I've seen some papers recently we've been working with different time of noising, like blurring, we're doing like this bubble effect stuff, and they've been producing interesting results. So yeah, I'm curious like if this is something that you guys thought about, or is it something that really depends on the data modality? Yeah. And then the second part, maybe related, not related, is uh, about the autoencoders. So yeah. we've been talking about variation autoencoders. Uh, and actually, in the class that uh, I took with you, we talked about beta VEDs, right? <laughs> and I think that's interesting to disentangle those different um, latent representation. And then I was thinking, I mean, did anyone ever try to sort of like do this separation on like sort of like the visual features, sort of like try to decouple uh, them from the perspective of a human, for example, two objects in an image or three objects or something like that? Uh, maybe I'm going crazy, but um, I I was just curious about how come beta VEs haven't been explored in the sort of like image generation uh, yeah. domain, and then how does it have to do with noise or Gaussian noise, and how we're modeling that? Uh, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are on these. Yeah, no, these are all great. <laughs> these are all great questions. Um, oh shoot, I deleted the one that I was thinking of here. So the, first of all, the paper for other people who are interested in the paper you're referencing, uh, one of them is called cold diffusion yeah. and they use other types of noise models. So this relationship that I derived really did rely on Gaussian noise to get that, that equality log P of X equals whatever. It's really for Gaussian noise. But uh, the cold diffusion paper basically said like, well, let's not like, let's not get distracted by the math. Let's just do something from an engineering point of view, which works add noise and then subtract it. Like that's a really well-defined thing to do. And um, basically what they show is that, um, you know, we can add all sorts of noise and then subtract it in this sort of hierarchical way. And it works great. So like maybe don't worry about the probability. You won't get a probability model then, but you might do a great job at generating images. So I think that's kind of interesting. And I, I wonder from the mathematical point of view, whether there's like a, a way to see that other types of noising, denoising can also lead to uh, density estimation because there's sort of like a more general perspective about like how do we transport from one like simple density model to a complex one. And it seems like uh, it seems like there's mathematical reasons to think that this can be a very general transformation uh, that we could correct for, or you, no matter what type of noise we added, we could we could find a way to weight the paths appropriately. So anyway, I think that that's possible. 
But at the moment, that's like all kind of engineering driven. Um, but you can see that there might be advantages because they use things like blurring, which is maybe more intuitive to humans than Gaussian noise, which is kind of strange. Uh, the other question, I, I had a slide, which I, I deleted, unfortunately, was uh, it was looking at these things like how compositional are diffusion models? Like if you ask it to do things like I want three red pigs sitting on a purple moon or whatever, and you start putting all these things together, you see it's actually not very good at any of this. Like it doesn't really know about the numbers of objects. And, and, if you, and, and in, in this example, it's like, if you give really weird combinations of objects, like really weird colors, it's priors to make things look like normal are so strong that it's very difficult to overwhelm this. So it doesn't like, and, and also like the relationships of things to each other. Like I want A on top of B next to C really mediocre. So there's definitely, because yeah, in a way you're saying like, let's add complexity to the scene. The probability distribution will have to, is it really modeling the complexity? I think the answer is currently no. Well, one question, I mean, for, for GPT models, the same question emerges is like, will just training with more data like lead to a model that can capture these more complex things? And man, when you look at some of the GP, GPT-4 results, it's like, wow, it's like, really, it's like, it's really good at math. Like it's learned some sort of internal math uh, module, which is pretty good. So, so we don't know the answer. Some people say, yes, more layers, more data, and it's gonna learn all of these things. And some people say, no, the failure, the, the current failure of these kind of compositional tasks is a, is a sign that we're moving, this is the wrong direction. Uh, I just saw a slide from Jan LeCun uh, from his talk, which was, Generative probabilistic models are a dead end. Autoregressive models are a dead end. We should abandon this whole line of research. I was like, dang, this guy is really is like not pulling any punches here. You know, like it's like the most successful things we've seen ever. And like he's like dead end. Forget it. <laughs> so anyway, so you know, so open open question. I think is really interesting to, Thank you so to much. think about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, so one more, one more. Oh, sure. Yeah, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. So I was wondering if you tried prompts for the heat map um, that are uh, the, in the information decomposition where you were uh, giving some prompt and trying to see the heat map on the image. Yeah. Uh, have you tried uh, prompts like something not about objects, but like something like relationship, like sitting by? Yeah, we we try we we tried a few like of these sort of like what we call like action words like sitting or running, uh, and they looked interesting, but they were kind of hard to interpret. So I didn't put them up. It's like I said, like like I said with the running thing, like what are the informative pixels about running? Maybe the legs, kind of, but it was it just wasn't very obvious what was happening. So we didn't, and it's possible that the models actually aren't representing that that they don't actually understand this. So. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's still kind of, a, that's kind of an unknown, I would say. Mm, I see. And you mentioned that you also tried it on like real images and generated images. Right, right, right. Did you see any difference? I, I mean, I would say that the generated images, like if the model generated the image, I feel like there was more information and a little bit crisper information that it detects like in those relationships versus, you know, images which were, it never saw these cocoa images. And so maybe it doesn't, as crisply understand the objects, but that's still also kind of not quantified. Uh, so, yeah. Um, sorry. So we, we should uh, we should officially end the thing, and we can talk more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so later I think that's okay. Yeah, so. it's already past noon. So um, I have no question about compositionality, but oh yes, yeah. and <laughs> feel, feel free to uh, after we done, but we can keep.